In an earlier video, I described how to create a work breakdown structure. In this video, I'll show you how to turn it into a network diagram. Let's look at the six broad steps that you need to take to turn a work breakdown structure into a network diagram. Step one, review your work breakdown structure. First, ensure that it breaks the work all the way down into individual tasks. Review each work package within the work breakdown structure and look to see that it breaks the work down into small enough activities or tasks to create your network diagram. Each task needs to contribute to the production of a deliverable or a product or to be a facilitator in that process. But critically, each task needs to be something that the person that's going to be doing the task or the people that are going to be doing the task will recognize it as a single thing that they completely understand. Second, ensure clarity. Make sure that each task is properly defined clearly and unambiguously. It needs a defined work requirement and an output if we are to properly estimate the time it will take and the resources it will need to deliver that task. When you've reviewed your work breakdown structure, we move to step number two. Step two, establish dependencies and sequencing. The first part of this is to determine the logical dependencies between tasks. Typically, these will be finish to start dependencies. That is a dependency which requires you to finish one task before starting another. Start to start dependencies, which require you to start two tasks in a coordinated way. Or finish to finish dependencies, which require the end of each task to be coordinated with one another. To help with the sequencing, we then need to define successor and predecessor tasks. That is to identify for each task which other tasks it succeeds, its predecessor tasks, and potentially to also identify the successor tasks to it. This means adding columns to your work breakdown structure dictionary so that you can record the successor and predecessor tasks. You can also add a column to identify what the relationship is, whether it is start to start, finish to finish, or finish to start. You might also want to identify whether these are mandatory or discretionary dependencies. Some dependencies are mandatory, which means they are required by the nature of the work. For example, you can't start building a building until you have designed it. Other dependencies are discretionary. That is, they are defined by your preferred approach, which is your choice. For example, the order in which you collect data. Another column you might choose to add to your work breakdown structure dictionary at this stage is one for leads and lags, but I'll talk about those in a minute. Step three, arrange your activities in order. Firstly, you need to define your start and end points. When will you start the project? When will you start that first task? And also, what is the last task you need to complete to finish the project? Next, place your tasks in sequence. Define a logical order determined by your dependencies between your predecessors and your successors. Start with the tasks that have no predecessors and then link them to their immediate successors. This will create a logical flow, a sequence of activities that will be the basis of your network diagram. Next, identify parallel paths paths between series of dependent activities that are not dependent on one another. Sometimes parallel paths will connect up later in the project plan, so be aware that that can happen too. By running tasks concurrently or in parallel, you can allow the project to proceed more quickly without necessarily creating a bottleneck. But this is only possible if you have enough resources to resource each path that is parallel to the main one. Step four, assign durations and allocate resources. First, 
estimate the activity durations. For each activity, make an estimate of how long it will take, which is why you need a clear definition of what the task is required to do. At the beginning, rough estimates will be useful to help you to build your chart and to estimate where the critical path lies. And later, you can put more precision on your estimates as you learn more. You also need to allocate resources. Decide which resources you will allocate to each task and how much of their time you will allocate. This could be one full resource to a task, one full time equivalent, or it could be someone working part time, a fractional full time equivalent, or it could be multiple resources with therefore more than one full time equivalent resource allocated to the task. When you've estimated the time it will take to deliver a task and you've allocated resources to that task, you can now estimate the true task duration. Because there are two times associated with the task. There's the activity time and then there is the elapsed time. The activity time is the amount of work we need to put into the task, the amount of total time activity that is required to get the task done. The elapsed time is the amount of time on the clock that it takes to do it. So, for example, if we have a task that has a task time of one day, but we put someone in only half time, it will take them two days to do it. Some tasks are susceptible to parallel working, which means that if you put two people on the task, it will take half a day. But for some tasks, that just doesn't work. Finally, with all of your estimates and allocations in and you knowing the durations of the tasks in terms of elapsed time, you can review the sequencing of your activities to make sure that you haven't created any logical problems or indeed any resource bottlenecks. If resources are limited, this can affect both the duration of tasks, but also your ability to do tasks in parallel. This may change the sequencing, the order of tasks that you're going to do. Step five, draw the network diagram. Now you have done all the preparation, you can start to create the network diagram that you need. Network diagrams are made of nodes and arrows, and there are two conventions. The first is the activity on node or precedence diagram approach. This uses a box or sometimes a circle to represent each activity and then arrows to connect them up to represent the dependencies and the sequencing of those activities. The alternative is an activity on arrow diagram or the arrow diagram method. This uses the arrows to represent the activities which are connected together by small nodes representing the links that create the sequence. My personal preference and my sense of which is the most common is the activity on node approach, but both are equally good. So use the one that you and your stakeholders are most comfortable with. It's important to note that for both of them, the arrow lengths do not change from activity to activity or from link to link. They do not represent the time they merely represent the logic of the diagram. And it's also important to note that there are a large number of different software tools you can use for creating this. Some of them are built into proper project management planning tools, which generate your network diagram automatically once you've created all the logic of the dependencies and the leads and the lags and the durations and the resource allocations. But there are lots of drawing tools that you can use to create a network diagram, understanding the logic yourself. You do also need to add leads and lags. So let's explain what they are. If we've got a logical dependency, for example, a finish to start dependency, where something finishes before the other thing can start, a lag is a delay between the finish of the first thing and the start of the next thing. So a lag is a gap between a predecessor task and a successor task. On the other hand, a lead is an overlap between the predecessor and the successor. That is to say, the successor task starts before the end of the predecessor task, 
or in a start to start dependency, the successor task would start before the predecessor task starts. So a lead is like a negative lag. Leads are relatively uncommon, but lags are common. Sometimes we can't start something till something else has either started or finished, but we do need to create a delay. For example, if I paint a wall, then my second coat can't start until I finish the first coat. But I also need to allow a lag, the time for the first coat to dry properly before I can start to prepare and paint the second coat. Next, label and annotate your network diagram with the information that is useful to you, to your stakeholders, to your governance boards, to your team. The kind of information you may use to label your diagram are things like resource names or initials, estimated times or durations for tasks, or the total amount of work required. Finally, when you've done all of this, double check your thinking. Take a look at the logic, the sequencing, to make sure that it works. Check all of the estimates that you've made to see if you can find any errors in them. Ideally, get a second pair of eyes, someone who hasn't been involved in a preparation to take a look to see if they can spot anything. And of course, make sure that every task that's on your work breakdown structure is included properly on your chart and that the relationships you documented in your WBS dictionary are properly represented in the relationships between the tasks on your diagram. Step six, validate and refine. If you can, have a team review. Ask your team to review your network diagram critically. Use subject matter experts to review your estimates and durations your logic and your sequencing, and your resource allocation choices. Look out for key problems like resource overloading, or indeed underloading, or missed dependencies, or indeed tasks that might have got left out of your work breakdown structure. And then take this feedback and update your network diagram. Adjust durations, dependencies, or sequences based on what your subject matter experts and review team are telling you. This creates your baseline network diagram, a diagram which you may update as you learn more throughout your project. So that leads us to the last step. Step seven, finalize your network diagram. Make one last check to ensure that everything on your WBS Every task, every activity, every relationship is properly represented. And then you have your baseline. This will be a key reference for all your scheduling, resource allocation, project monitoring and control. Communicate your network diagram to everybody who needs to be aware of it. Make it easily available and publish it as a control document for the governance of your project. So the basic process of creating a network diagram is simple. Extract activities from your work breakdown structure, determine their logical sequence and dependencies, estimate their durations, then visually map them out as a network diagram. After validation and refinement, you have a robust tool to help you to manage, and monitor your project. Please do give this video a like if you've enjoyed it or learned from it. I'll be making loads more great project management videos for you, so please do subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of them. I look forward to seeing you in the next video, and in the meantime, keep learning.